Good morning, Moses Lake Christian Church family, and welcome to our online worship service. It's great to have you here with us this morning, and while I wish that we were all together in our facility, I am sure thankful for technology that is allowing us to worship together virtually. As we prepare our hearts this morning, I want to share with you one of my favorite scriptures, Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. May our hearts be prepared for what the Lord has for us this morning. Genesis 16, verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are God of seed. For she said, Truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sits them with the princes and with the princes of his people. He settles the ch childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. From the message, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. Matthew 5, 4. Her ch children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate.
Holy, holy, holy God. 
Good morning, Moses Lake Christian Church. As we continue to worship together, we turn our thoughts towards our offering and our time of communion. In regards to offering, I want to just remind us what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, where he says, Give and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and it will be poured into your lap. You know, we serve a generous God, don't we? God has given us all that we need for life and godliness. According to his scriptures, he's provided abundantly for us. And so let's remember, as we are receiving from God, we want to make the intentional choice to give back to God as well. During these times, probably the greatest way to do that, remembering our local church, is to give online. So I encourage you to go to mlcc.us and sign up for online giving and continue to give of our tithes and our offerings to God. Let's be generous people during a difficult time because we serve a generous God. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the abundance that you have given us. Even in difficult times, Lord, we can look around and see incredible blessings in our lives and our families. Thank you for the resources you've given us. Help us to be good stewards, good managers of all that you've given us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we think about communion this morning, on this Mother's Day, honoring the women in our lives. You know, there's probably no uh, greater attribute that I think about when I think about my mom than uh, the attribute of giving. My mom, who passed away a couple of years ago, actually celebrated her, remembered her birthday this last week. So I think about my mom, uh, I think about just her generosity and her giving spirit. Mom was quick to give. She was quick to give of her time. She was quick to give of her resources. She was quick to give of a smile or her laughter. Moms in general, and, and my mom specifically, uh, was somebody that just gave. And you know, you think about where did that come from? It, it really comes because uh, she and, and women all around us are created in the image of God. When we think about giving, that's an attribute of God as well. And as we think about communion, communion is really remembering all that has been given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. John 3, 16 and 17, very familiar verses to us, says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And as we take some time this morning to remember Jesus, as we think about his broken body, his blood shed for us, as we take some simple bread and some simple juice and remember Jesus, let's remember that he gave. We in and of ourselves, because of sin, are separated from God. And the good news of the gospel is that because of God's great love for us, he sent Jesus. And Jesus came to earth to live to die, to be resurrected on the third day. And in communion, we remember. That's what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so this morning, we intentionally desire to stop, to remember all that Jesus gave. And because of his sacrifice, because of him paying the penalty for our sins, we can be forgiven. We can have right standing and fellowship and relationship with God, both now and for eternity. And so as we think about communion, I encourage you to grab some bread and some juice to take a few moments, maybe to read through John 3, 16 and 17. And this morning, let's remember all that Jesus gave to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for willingly leaving heaven. Thank you for coming to earth and living a sinless life. Thank you for giving us an example. Thanks for being the, the God who showed up in person here on earth. Thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. And this morning through communion, we choose to remember you. Thank you for taking our sin upon the cross. Thank you for your perfect sacrifice so that we could call you Savior and Lord. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You spoke and worlds were formed. You breathed and life was born. You knew that one day you would come. So 
Well, today is Mother's Day and I am here at the beautiful Japanese gardens in Moses Lake. And you may know that the Japanese gardens aren't open yet, but shout out to Moses Lake Parks and Rec. I asked for and was granted permission to come in. So I didn't climb over the fence, but we thought this would be a fun place to record this week's sermon. So we're grateful that they let me be here. I'm alone, I can assure you, and quite socially distanced. But it is Mother's Day and we didn't want to let this day go by without acknowledging it and saying thank you to the mothers in our lives. I am personally so grateful for the mothers in my life. For my mother-in-law who uh, brought my wife into the world, to my mother who brought me into the world and who, while she's been gone for 23 years, impacted my life a great deal. I still miss her a lot. To the mother of my sons, Charlene, to whom I'm married and with whom I've been journeying for these nearly 33 years. And to my daughter-in-law, the mother of my grandchildren, whom I have come to uh, really appreciate. I really hope that you'll take the time today to celebrate the mothers in your life. Of course, there's another painful reality with celebration days like today. And that is that while for many, it's a joyful celebration for some, it's a very painful reminder of difficult times. For the women who would very much like to have children, but for whatever number of reasons have not been able to. For mothers who've lost children, either prior to childbirth or after childbirth. 
for whom this day is likely a very painful reminder, it's probably impossible to really comprehend that pain unless you've been through it. We have women in our midst for whom this is a very present reality. And for those women who perhaps long to have a family, but again, for whatever reason, don't have one. I hope that we can remember those who may be in pain today and be thoughtful about what they're going through. But as a church, we thought this would be a great day to celebrate the women, the mothers, but also the women that God has placed in our lives and in the world, the amazing and courageous women that God has used throughout history and throughout his story and throughout our stories to make an impact. In preparation for this talk, I was reminded of a, a group of essays written by Dorothy L. Sayers. I first read in 2008 and I went back and reread it this week titled, Are Women Human? Now, if you don't have time to read Dorothy L. Sayers' essays uh, or the inclination, let me just summarize it for you. This is what she essentially says. It turns out that women are human and they should do what fits them best. Let's talk about Dorothy Sayers for just a moment. She was a remarkable woman. She was born in Oxford, England in 1893 and lived till 1957. She was a lay theologian, which is to say that she wouldn't have considered herself and she didn't consider herself a, a theologian by trade. She was a Christian apologist and she wrote both fiction and nonfiction. She authored and directed a radio uh, drama for the BBC during, during World War II titled The Man Born to be King, in which she does a very early job of making the story of Jesus really human. In fact, she got a fair amount of trouble for, for pulling out all the religious language of the story, but, but she makes the point that it is a human story. She was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford, earning her degree in medieval literature with first honors in 1951. She was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. She rode motorcycles and she liked to wear pants, but not in order to ape or imitate the men, but she said because they were practical and they were comfortable and they kept out the draft. I suppose it's easier to ride a motorcycle in pants than a dress. She was a, remar a remarkable woman who believed that women were human, created in God's image with various gifts and that they should use those gifts with which God had created them to do what they were meant to do. She wasn't a feminist, however, by her own admission, and she really didn't like the term. She made the statement a little irritably, I'm not sure I want to identify myself with feminism. I think under the present conditions, an aggressive feminism might do more harm than good. She believed, and she said, we are all equal in our creaturehood, whatever our sex, color, age, background, or abilities, but we are all different in the functions we were created to perform, as different as water from stones, as different as engineering from imaginative fiction. Therefore, the primary task in living for any human being is to do and to find that work for which he or she was created. She said that it was repugnant to every human being to be reckoned as a member of a class and not as an individual person. Each person ought to be able to shine with the light that they've been given and do what they've been given in the world to do. She said, every woman is a human being. One cannot repeat that too often. And a human being must have occupation if he or she is not to become a nuisance to the world. Sayers writing about Queen Elizabeth I of the United Kingdom, who people didn't quite know what to do with, wrote this. It's, it is extraordinarily entertaining to watch the historians entangling themselves in what they were pleased to call the problem of Queen Elizabeth. They invented the most complicated and astonishing reasons for her success as a sovereign. She was diseased, she was deformed, she was a man in disguise, she was a mystery. Only recently has it occurred to a few enlightened people that the solution might be quite simple after all. She might be one of the rare people who were born into the right job and put that job first, whereupon a whole series of riddles cleared themselves up by magic. And we see throughout history that God's story is replete with amazing and courageous women. We should remember them. When you unpack the story of God, there are a multitude of women 
who are woven into the fabric of a story, who hold the story together at various times. Think about some of the remarkable women of the Old Testament. Ruth, she's a Moabite woman who taught us about God's faithfulness and provision. She's in the line of David and of Jesus, which is interesting because she's not a Jew. You can read about her, of course, in the book of Ruth. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who prayed faithfully for a child and then dedicated him to the service of God. You can read her story in 1 Samuel 1 and following. Deborah was the only female judge during the period of the judges who distinguished herself for being a compassionate and wise leader. You can read her story in Judges chapter 4 and 5. Deborah was a leader of Israel. She was a prophetess and a judge and a military leader. She's described as a mother in Israel because of her role in delivering God's people. After Moses, only Samuel filled those three roles, uh, a prophet and judge and military leader at the same time. Esther, you may remember, who showed great courage with the king of Persia and saved the Jews through the power of prayer and great bravery. Of course, you read about her in the book of Esther. Esther is the story of a young Jewish orphan girl who was raised by her uncle Mordecai in Persia. She became queen of Persia by marrying the king of Persia, Ahasuerus. And when she learned of a plot to wipe out the Jewish people, she courageously entered the king's presence without being summoned, which could have meant her death in order to expose the plot and save her people. Miriam, you may remember, is Moses' older sister who played a key role in rescuing Moses, who then goes on to rescue the nation of Israel. You can read a bit about her in Exodus chapter two, verses four through eight. There are other amazing women in the Old Testament story, but also think about some of the women we know of in the New Testament story, who were also courageous and remarkable women. Certainly, you probably should start with Mary, the mother of Jesus, who just as a young woman taught us that we don't have to fully understand God to follow the call of God and to be obedient to his voice, even though it might turn out to be really uncomfortable. She says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me as you have said in Luke chapter one, verse 38, when she's told that she's going to become pregnant and bear a child and that child will be the savior of the world. I think about Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who we know chose the better part in one part of the story. In John chapter 10, verses 41 and 42, Martha comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, can you tell Mary to get up and help me do the serving? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious about and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Dorothy Sayers says that we always make an uncomfortable story of Mary and Martha. Martha's doing work that we all need her to do, but Mary's doing what actually any disciple, male or female, would do. She's sitting at Jesus' feet and Jesus commends her for it. In John chapter 11, verse two, Mary is the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. The Pharisees saw her as a sinful woman, but Jesus sees her differently. In Luke chapter seven, verse 44, Jesus says to the Pharisees, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet. She's pointing to the reality of the Messiah. Priscilla of the New Testament, married to Aquila, a, a couple commonly known for a powerful ministry and generosity to those in need. It's not a new insight, but it's interesting to notice again that in the instances that Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, she's mentioned first two thirds of the time. She's an important person in the kingdom and in the work of God. One of my favorite chapters in the, in the New Testament is Romans chapter 16, in part 
because Paul makes a list there of people who really made an impact in the kingdom. Some of those people were women, 10 of them, in fact, that he mentions. They had really significant impact in expanding the kingdom into the world. Now, I understand that Paul gets a hard time for saying such things as, I don't allow a woman to speak in church or calling women busybodies. And, and Paul is doubtless addressing really specific circumstances that were going on in various churches when he speaks about these things. But here in Romans, he greets those who've had a lasting impact on the advancement of the kingdom during his life. And a significant number of them are women. We can't understand Paul's view of women without reading the whole New Testament, the whole of Paul's writings at least. But listen to what he says here in Romans chapter 16 as he talks about the people that really impacted the kingdom. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Cancrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from me, for she is a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who was the first convert of Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who approved in Christ, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus and Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philogius, Julia, Nurus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Are you glad you didn't have to read that list of names? I'm not going to do it again. But throughout God's story, we see these amazing and courageous women who impact the world with their life and their faith. And Paul reminds us uh, of those women when he reminds Timothy of who had influenced his life so profoundly. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you. Paul says, this faith that you're living out it came to you through your grandmother and your mother and it has profoundly impacted you and you're living out that faith now as well. And so on this day, this Mother's Day, we want to remember and to celebrate our mothers and we want to remember also going further, the women who are impacting the world around us. Our lives are filled with amazing and courageous women. We should celebrate them. Who are the women in your life who are living out God's call, who are doing what they were fitted for, who are doing what they were called to do, and who are making a difference in your life and the world because of their commitment? Maybe they're the mothers in your life. Again, when I think of the mothers in my own family, I'm reminded of their courage. While my mom didn't complete high school education, at the time of her death, she was the director of a crisis pregnancy center and spent significant time going around to high schools and uh, having um, speaking to high school students and junior high students about reproductive issues. I think about the mother of my sons, Charlene, who I admire a, a great deal. Who went back to school a few years ago and finished up her teaching degree and now is spending her days trying to coax parents and first graders 
into coming online to learn what they need to learn. I, had, I admire my daughter-in-law who, who by her choices has brought a lot of goodness and truth and beauty into our lives as a family. Maybe there are other women in your life too that you want to celebrate. As we think about our mothers, certainly we celebrate them, but what are the other women in the world who are making an impact that we want to, to celebrate? As we walk through this time in our world, in this pandemic, we're surrounded by amazing and courageous women who are leading all kinds of organizations. They're leading our health departments. They are researchers. They are physicians. They're first responders. They're nurses. They're caretakers. They're government leaders. They're spiritual advisors. They're teachers. They're mothers. They're grandmothers. They're everywhere. And we should notice them and celebrate them and celebrate their victories and their impact in our lives. Often they are the ones who remind us that there's something bigger than I. And one of the things that we have learned in this pandemic is that there's something bigger than I. There's the we. I was reminded of this, of this poem in the book, Leading From Within, which is a delightful book of poetry, of a poem by Adrienne Rich, and it's titled, In Those Years, In those years, people will say, we lost track of the meaning of we, of you. We found ourselves reduced to I, and the whole thing became silly, ironic, terrible. We were trying to live a personal life, and yes, that was the only life we could bear witness to. But the great dark birds of history screamed and plunged into our personal weather. They were headed somewhere else, but their beaks and pinions drove along the shore through the rags of fog where we stood saying, I. We're at a place in history where we have sometimes forgotten that it's bigger than us. And often it is the amazing and courageous women around us who remind us that there's something more than I. And we want to celebrate them. In these difficult times, let's remember to honor the people, specifically this week, to honor the mothers in our lives, to honor and celebrate the women who have enriched our lives and who make our lives better. And so I wanna invite you to think about a few questions. First of all, who are the women who have enriched and impacted your life personally? And then, who are the women in God's story that you most admire? Who are the Old Testament women that you most admire? Who are the New Testament women that you most admire? And why do you admire them? And then what is one thing that you've learned from, a, in, from an influential woman in your life that has stayed with you throughout your life? It would be interesting to make note of that. It would be interesting to let that woman know of the impact that she made in your life if she's still around to hear it. What is one way that you can celebrate and encourage the important women in your life this week? The women who live at your house, the women who are doing really important jobs in our culture, the women who are doing what they were made to do. And who are the women that you can pray for who are the women in your life that you can pray for as they carry out the tasks that they've been given? Sometimes it becomes very heavy, the burden that they carry. Who can you pray for? And then you could commit yourself this coming week to say thank you or to remind two or three women in your life of the impact that they have had on your life for good. We want to remember to celebrate the amazing and courageous people in our lives. This coming week and today, let's make it our aim to celebrate the women and the mothers in our lives. May God give us grace to live out the life that he's been given us, whether we're male or female. May he give us important work to do and may we do that work with faithfulness. May God give you emotional stability in your homes and relationships 
with your family, with your friends, with those that you're working with. May God bless you with a courageous faith that you can live out as you walk out these days. Take care. Thank you.